announcements again. Just wanted to remind you of some of the things we mentioned there on Sunday. Um, obviously, Kids Club on Thursday night. And then on Friday night, uh, there's a Christian Institute event, and that's at the Iron Hall. And that starts at 8 o'clock. And um, there's actually a pastor's briefing as well, but I'll be going to on the Thursday about that. So I would encourage people, if they are able to, on the, on the Friday to attend that. Um, they're talking about gender ideology and conversion therapy. And basically, the, the night's called Defending Faith, Family and Freedom. So um, these days we're living in, it's, it's good to be informed about these things um, as well too. And um, so the other thing is there's an, a variety of coffee mornings taking place on Saturday. As I say, if you're looking for somewhere to go on Saturday, you'll not be stuck. Uh, so there's Strain Presbyterian in the morning. And then also second combers having a coffee and wellness morning, and um, that's from ten thirty to one o'clock as well. And there's various things at that um, as well. So I encourage you, even if you are able to attend any of those, to, to do so. But let's begin our time by singing this hymn together. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath made known. So let's sing this together. Do you think you might need to hit the baby on back? You. at the moment. Thank you. 
once again, Lord. And Father, we give thanks that, Lord, your wondrous grace has been made known in our lives, that you've opened our eyes even to the truth of the gospel, and that, Father, you have saved us, you've forgiven us for our sins, Lord, and you've given us that assurance that you'll keep us, Lord, until that day. And Father, we do um, just give you thanks for even your sustaining grace in our lives and your mercy towards us. But Father, we are mindful even of that situation, even as we've seen on our TV screens tonight, we do pray for the families of those who have been uh, killed in this school shooting, in this Christian school in Nashville. We pray for those seeking to minister to those families, to comfort them, to help them. Lord, grant them the wisdom even as they speak in that situation. Lord, we do pray for that pastor also who's lost his young daughter as well. Mm -hmm. Lord, we struggle just to comprehend what goes through the mind of someone committing even such a, a terrible atrocity, Lord. But this terrible event does remind us that, Lord, we are living in a, a broken world. And even as we hear these shocking statistics, Lord, of how there's been more than 130 mass shootings in, in the U.S. in this year alone. Lord, it does remind us that even more that how we long for Christ to come. And even for the final consummation, Lord, when all things will be made new again. Lord, we do pray for those here hurting, for those here mourning. And Lord, even as we see these things in our world, just help us not to lose sight of the, the great heavenly hope that we have. And Father, we do pray that more we come to know of that hope. And so Father, help us even as we pray together later as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, so far in our series on why church, we've been looking at things that we do when we're gathered together and, and why it's important we gather. And as I mentioned before, this little series has been inspired by the Why Gather book by Tony Morita. Um, a number of churches have been using that and I find it helpful. And I began by focusing on what real fellowship truly is. Um, and then I moved on to some of the material in that Why Gather book and why we worship God together and pray together and why we sing together and hear God's word. And these are things that we're not only able to trace the roots back to the Old Testament, but we also saw from Acts 2 there were priorities in the early church. So we're going to turn to that familiar passage again in Acts 2, and we've we'll come back to this a, a few times now, um, because again we see some of these things just set out there as well too. So we're going to begin this familiar reading, and Acts 2 uh, verse 38 to 42, um, but I will say tonight don't close your Bibles because there's another passage we're going to come to in a little while. Uh, we're reading here from then the close really of Peter's sermon at Pentecost. And he challenged really the, um, the, the people he proclaimed Christ to them. He'd explained what was going on um, as well. Uh, the, the fact that they were now, these people were speaking in languages. And he'd explained how this was fulfillment, uh, fulfillment of prophecy. And also how Christ was a fulfillment of that prophecy as well too. And then he, he, he challenged them really in verse 37 he, when he reminded them of what they had done with Jesus. Peter then told them and they asked what, what must we do. In verse 38 Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for all your, and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And we under reading just there. You know, tonight we're going to consider two other important aspects of church life. As a body of believers, uh, one of which is something we do regularly, and the other one is a part of our witness yeah, and their conversion as well. So I'm talking tonight really about the, the what's termed off in the ordinances of the church. And I'll explain what that means as well too later. But in this passage we've read both of them. I've mentioned baptism and the breaking of bread of the Lord's Supper. And as I was preparing to look at this tonight, Tony Morita uh, urges us to think of these in a different way. 
and he entitles it as celebrating the gospel visually. We don't maybe think of that aspect of how like baptism and the Lord's Supper is actually celebrating the gospel visually. You know, as I explain why and how that is, we well, let's pause for a moment and consider why we observe these things. Again, this series it's it is explaining things we already do know, but it, it does remind us why we do them. But also I've tried to give us little also practical helps and encouragements of them as well. And also in this Why Gather series we've found out you know why we can't do some of these things remotely. We need to be actually gathered together as God's people, for example, to pray together. You know, it is important that we gather together to do that and hear God's word. But where do these ordinances then come from? Well, the first thing is there, it, it follows a biblical pattern. Because when Peter stood in front of the crowd in Pentecost that day, and as he spoke to those uh, people who were gathered, and as he explained what they were witnessing and exactly what it meant, he then presented them with the challenge. He reminded them what they had done with Christ. And really he was urging them to also repent of their sins. And then he says, be baptized for the forgiveness, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. And they too will receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is a biblical pattern to repent and be baptized. People were saved, baptized and added to the church. That was the biblical pattern again and again. And nowadays in today's church, sadly often, this is a pattern which isn't always followed. Uh, you find maybe sometimes either some are saved and maybe baptism doesn't often take place either until many years later. Or else the people are baptized and maybe unwilling to become members. But the biblical pattern is saved, baptized and added to the church. But here's the thing, scripture doesn't just affirm this because of what the early church did. It's also what Christ commanded as well. Christ commanded we observe these things. The command to baptize is given actually in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 10, uh, 20. When he came to his disciples, he commanded them to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And it doesn't end there. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I command to you. So being a disciple means to commit your life to Christ and being willing to live your life following his commands and subjecting ourselves to his authority, including this command to be baptized. And here's the thing, uh, something you notice when someone was saved, often there wasn't a delay. Typically when we see someone saved, it might be some either months or it could even be years before even they're baptized, but actually uh, that wasn't the way it was uh, in the early church. It often took place even soon after. So baptism is commanded in the in the ordinances, but something else as well um, is Christ commanded the Lord's Supper, of course, as well. And again, I could have put many references up here for this. I've just put one, uh, well, two really here. Uh, Mark fourteen, uh, verse twenty-two to twenty-five. On the night was Jesus was was about to be arrested, and uh, would even later be crucified. Uh, he met with his disciples in the upper room, uh, where he taught and ate this fellowship meal with them, and. There, while that was a Passover uh, meal as they met together, Jesus used, gave that a, a new significance. He gave it a new significance using the, the emblems of the bread and the wine to explain how he would deliver and rescue them. Because the Passover really was to remember um, how they also were delivered um, at that time when the angel passed over uh, the house as well. So the Passover reminded them of that. And now that took on new significance from Jesus when he taught them how he also would deliver them. But of course he was going to give of himself. He would be the Passover lamb. Um, and 1 Corinthians 11, of course, that's the passage we read every Sunday. And that's the, the larger sort of passage that's taken from. Jesus said to his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. They would eat the bread and drink the cup. Proclaim the Lord's death. So these things were commanded by God and ordained by the Lord, and that's why we call them ordinances, because they were ordained by God, uh, by the Lord. And so we, when we observe these things, they show also our commitment to Christ. These are things to be observed in the context of the church, rather than something that simply individuals do. So uh, we are familiar, of course, with baptism and communion. So for that reason, I'm not going to labour the point in this, or not going to do it really over two.
low sand not, depending on how the first bit goes. If it goes on too long, I might maybe do it over two, but we'll see how we get on. Um, so I want us to consider not just about their importance, but also their significance to us as individuals. Turn to Romans 6. When we come to talk about baptism, have a look at Romans 6. There are many passages again I'm going to turn to you here. We'll talk about that in a moment as well too. In Romans 6 it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abide? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection uh, body like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So what we see is baptism is not the idea of man. It's God's idea. It's also not a denominational thing as well. It's a biblical thing. It wasn't just a command of Jesus. Um, it was something also that wasn't just practiced by the early church. But also Jesus himself also uh, was baptized as well. It wasn't that Jesus needed to repent, of course, and be cleansed from sin, because he had no sin. But he did that, Matthew 3, 15 says, in order to fulfill all righteousness. He believed it was something, in other words, that God required him to do. And also, when he did that, he identified with, with sinners as well. Uh, Jesus also baptized as well too. We read that in John 3, verse 22, and John 4, verses 1 to 2. So Jesus also baptized people, so it wasn't just the, the early church. So it was something Christ commanded, something that he submitted to uh, as well too. And it was something also he did with others as well. But what does baptism mean? It's interesting that Paul actually wrote 13 letters in our Bibles. But actually he refers to baptism in no less than five of them. He talks about baptism in five. Um, so in verse 3 of Romans 6, Paul shows us that baptism is... An outward physical symbol of the inward spiritual conversion that's already taken place. So quite simply, it's a sign of what God has done for us. We've been united with Christ, Paul says here in Romans 6. So when we trust in Christ, we receive the benefits of his death for us. Forgiveness of sin. Uh, it also signifies the death of the old life uh, um, of sin and rebellion. And we've now died to sin as Paul says here we're also united with Christ in his resurrection we've been raised with him in a spiritual sense that we might live a new life and also in the future we'll be raised uh, to new life as well too we'll be raised from death but Paul also shows here in these verses how baptism is a visible celebration of the gospel because there is great symbolism in the, the actual act of baptism Whenever the believer is lowered into the water, it proclaims the death of the old self. It speaks of cleansing, of course, and we know that cleansing has nothing to do with the water itself, but it's a symbol of the, the internal reality, really. It's already taken place of being forgiven in Christ. Being raised from the water also speaks of being raised in newness of life. And that is a, a visible celebration of the gospel. You know, we sometimes don't think of it that way, but it, it is. It is. And there's great symbolism even in those actions. And Paul reminds us, if we've been united with Christ in his death, we'll be united in his resurrection life. And, you know, being united to Christ also means that all the resources that are in Christ become ours too. It talks about, in uh, Romans 6, verse um, 6, it talks about power of sin also has been broken. And that means, it doesn't mean that we won't be tempted or that we'll never sin, but sin should no longer be the dominant thing in a believer's life. Our life should no longer be marked by that pattern of sin. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it does mean now we're seeking to live for Christ. So it is a vivid picture of what God has done for us. But something else, it's also a sign of our commitment to Christ. And being baptised, we're obeying Christ's command. And we're publicly professing our faith. Pledging allegiance also to Christ as our Lord. And think about that in the early church. Because at the time of the early church... Caesar was the one who people, Caesar wanted people to call him Lord. So actually to stand up and say, Christ is my Lord. 
was actually something that was really a profound witness in the community that they were living in. You know, when someone is baptized, it can be an important testimony to friends and family. It's identifying not just with Christ, but also with his people as well too. There's all that symbolism in there as well. And, and Tony Marita remarks, it's also a proclamation to the spiritual realm. Because you're proclaiming Christ as Lord, and knowing that one day you're affirming even that you believe that one day even he will reign as well, and you will be with him. So... But here's another challenge he brings out, uh, that actually I think it's Sinclair Ferguson, when he writes about it, brings out. It has lifelong implications. I wonder what you think about that. Baptism has lifelong implications. I think when we think of baptism, we just think of it as, if I was to ask you about your baptism, you'd talk of that moment. And you would remember it well, I'm sure. Uh, you'd maybe remember who baptized you. You would remember maybe if there was a hymn played after when you came out of the water. Uh, you'd remember all these things. But, you know, it's actually lifelong implications. Because it's not that the baptism changes, but rather we are baptized into the family of God. We have a new identity. Jesus commanded us to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this commitment then that we've made, of course, has lifelong implications. We're united with Christ. We abide in Christ. And baptism is a powerful symbol of that union with Christ. And I wonder, do you realize, Paul, uh, I know when I referred to Ephesians, we were around the table, have remarked in this, that Paul in Ephesians often uses that phrase, in him, we are in Christ. In Ephesians 1, he talks about um, various blessings we have because we are in Christ. We are adopted in Christ. We are brought into the family in Christ. We have an inheritance in Christ. And that's again and again. But actually in Paul's letters, believe it or not, he talks about that 150 times. 150 times. I think that says a lot about the importance of this union with Christ. It's maybe something we don't really think as much about. What it means to be united in Christ. Maybe that's an idea for another sermon series some other time. But, you know... That is a powerful thing, an amazing thing. And, but sadly today we're living in an age where atheism seems to have a great sway. And I only found out about this, actually just reading this this morning. Um, apparently in the new atheism movement, there's actually, there's been some who have been demanding a bapti baptism renunciation certificate. It's those who have um, come away from the faith who said now they want to repudiate the baptism that they receive, that they have received and become unbaptized. How tragic that is. But listen to what Hebrews 6 says about such people. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who once have been enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, and restore them to repentance, since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding them up to contempt. You know, that's not to say that a backslider can't come back to the Lord. You know, certainly we have, I'm sure you've you've known of others who have come back to the Lord, and we give thanks to God for that. But for someone who stays in that willful state of rejection, it shows that, what, 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 what did they truly believe in the first place? You know, we need to pray for those who have strayed from the faith. We pray that the Lord would bring them back, that the Lord would speak to them again and keep praying for them, not give up on that. You know, baptism is such an important, visible display of the gospel. It's a powerful thing. But also so is communion. And you know, one of the things that we um, did one of the times in one of our college teams, we got the opportunity actually to go into it was a Catholic school. And actually they were curious about what Baptists believe. And one of the ways we actually talked about what it means to be a Christian is actually using the ordinance as well. We talked about distinctives of, of what Baptists believe, but we also use baptism to speak about conversion, and we also talked about communion to speak, even about Christ's death and the significance of that. You know, because it is a visible proclamation of the gospel, and what we see from our Bibles is that the Lord's Supper, uh, the ordinance of communion, is important. You know, it's not just some extra part tagged on at the end of a service, but an active part of the main service of the church. And I very much 
building is that it's normally why I don't actually usually go to the door because I actually want people to stay for the communion and normally try and make that part of the service. Now this passage in 1 Corinthians reminds us of what we do at the Lord's Supper. If you, you turn to 1 Corinthians 11, I'm not going to read this um, whole passage, but I'll refer to some verses in this. There's several things we do, and again, I know you know these things, but uh, we'll just remind ourselves of this. Because when we come to the, the Lord's table, we remember, of course, we remember Jesus' death, we remember the significance for us, and those emblems symbolize what Jesus did for us. The, the bread reminding us of his body given for us and broken for us. The wine and the juice reminding us of how he gave of his lifeblood. And we see that in verses 24 to 25 in 1 Corinthians 11. When we think about that in a city like Corinth which was saturated with idols. When the believers sat down and received the bread and the wine together, they were affirming their faith in Christ and to one another to live for him. This reminder was needed. They did that regularly, reminding themselves in the city of islands where they lived, they were saying, no, we belong to Christ. And that communion was an important part of that. It was a testimony of that as well. Also in communion, of course, we know we give thanks at the table. We give thanks for what God has done in Christ. There's something else we do. We also examine ourselves. And uh, Verse 28, we see that. And that's something I'll say more about that in a little second. We'll come back to that. But also in communion, we, we share in fellowship with others as well too. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we all sit around the table. And we sit together as a church family. As a body of believers. Members of the body of Christ. We proclaim also something else. We proclaim, verse 26, the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is a proclamation. When we partake of those elements, we are testifying that it's through Christ we're saved. Not through our merit, not through any of our righteousness of our own. No, it's through what Christ, and because of what Christ has done. And so we, we take these emblems also with anticipation. Because we know as well that we won't celebrate the Lord's Supper forever. Because we do this only until he comes. St. Barry Ferguson remarks that in a way the Lord's Supper is like a wedding rehearsal dinner at the expense of the groom's father. It's a bit like that because it's a foretaste of something that will come. We know that one day Christ will return for his bride, the church, and there will be a day even later on where there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb. That day will be a perfect fellowship together. You know, the Lord's table is but a foretaste of that day. And we give that, I mean, one of the reasons why I do read that passage every week is to remind us uh, of that. It is till he comes. But here's, I suppose, a little warning in this passage as well too. We talked about examining ourselves. We're never to treat this lightly, the Lord's table, because God doesn't, God doesn't treat it lightly. In Corinth, there was a variety of issues in the church. And there was divisions in the church, there was immorality, there was people living in unrepentant sin. And quite simply, when they gathered for communion, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And so Paul sought to rebuke this. He also reminded them what communion was and its significance. And you know, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, people can sometimes focus on the wrong things. For example, was the passage in Corinthians read? Did they read something different? Or did they read another passage at all? You know, we don't always have to read that passage. I, I kind of like to, you know, very often. But I also don't want it to become ever a formula that we just hear the words and not really think about what they mean. So if I don't do it some week, it will fall out with me. But, you know, it's I do that to remind us. I might maybe sometimes read another passage there as well too. But others also might focus on the emblems. I might say, ah, don't know about that type of bread that's used there this week or or the way it's been prepared, or don't know about the cups, you know. But that's not the point as we approach the table. These things are emblems. They're meant to remind us of something. The point is not really the emblems themselves. It's what they represent is key. And it's important we never forget that. These are just visible reminders about what Christ has done for us. So 
And what Paul tells us, it's important our attitudes we come to the table. And one thing we see from the passage in 1 Corinthians 11, that as believers, when we come to this table, we are to examine ourselves. Now, what does it mean to examine ourselves? And I'm going to finish here with this point. Because quite simply, you know, it could be really, generally, are we in a right relationship with God as we come around the table? But I want to suggest two things as we come around the table. We need to examine our own attitude to our sin as we come around the table. I was talking a little bit about this on Sunday in the stillness before we prepare to take the emblems. It should be a time to examine our lives, to repent of even any sin as well too. In before taking those emblems, or maybe even if in a relationship with another brother or sister in the church isn't what it should be, then Jesus uh, urged people to urge brothers to, to leave their, their, their gift and go immediately to seek reconciliation with their brother before even bringing an offering to God. He urged this to, to ensure that the relationship was right. So we need to examine our own attitude to the sin in our own life. J.C. Ryle put it very plainly. Sinners living in open sin and determined not to give it up ought on no account to come to the Lord's table. He says to do so is a positive insult to Christ and to pour contempt in his gospel. He says it's nonsense to profess we desire to remember Christ's death while we cling to the accursed thing which made it needful for Christ to die. You know, we need to examine our attitude as we come around the table, even to our own sin. Also, we need to examine our attitude to Christ and his work of redemption. Are we truly thinking about that as we come around the table? Or are we just going through emotions? Do we ever come with it properly regarding what these emblems represent? Tom Askell wrote, Self-examination, it's not meant to be a barrier to communion, but rather a preparation for it. And I think that's a really helpful way to think about this. What it means to examine ourselves. We are actually preparing to take the table rightly. It's not so much a barrier to communion, but rather to prepare for it. To prepare for it. And so after we've examined ourselves, as Paul says, we can eat and drink of the cup. You know, as we close, I wonder do we realise how important these ordinances actually are to us as believers? You know, maybe you never think about your, your baptism after this taking place many years later, but you made that declaration, that public testimony. You're now united to Christ, and that has ongoing implications when we become believers. We identify with Christ in our baptism. We are united in Christ when we're saved. And the Lord's Supper as well, we have that communion also even with one another. You know, we could say more about these things, but... They celebrate the gospel in our lives. And I think that's a really good and helpful way actually to think about them. We celebrate the gospel. And you've heard me say it before. But the gospel is something that's not just for non-Christians. It's for us as believers as well too. And we need to keep preaching it to ourselves. And to live in light of the truths of the gospel. But in these ordinances, when you think of it, both of them celebrate the gospel clearly. So let us give thanks for the ordinances which God has given us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that when we gather together, we can have even a time of communion together. We can partake of the emblems in the table. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for this you've given us. How it does remind us, how it does encourage us, how it strengthens us as well too. To meet with brothers and sisters, to have this visual representation of the gospel, reminding us of why, what Christ has done for us. And Father, even our baptism, that public proclamation, that reminder that we are united in Christ, we identify with Christ. And Father, just help us to proclaim the gospel with our lives, as believers to grow in the gospel. And so Lord, help us as we seek to live for you, and even just to, to pray about even different matters for prayer. Even now, in Jesus' name, amen.